A very warm welcome to the 2001 Philips Wolf and Inspire Europe Forum. I am Judith Weil, Head of the Strategy and External Relations Department here at the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and and my name is Frank Albrecht. I am a program director for the Philip Schwartz Initiative. And uh, Frank and I have the pleasure um, to be your masters of ceremony and uh, guide you through today's events. And first of all, we would like to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, we do know that uh, many of us would have preferred to meet in person and there's nothing that can replace human face-to-face -face encounters. Uh, that much is for sure. But uh, there is one great up uh, upside uh, to having a virtual event. People can really join us from, from anywhere, and that's actually the case. So we will have speakers and attendees who join us from different countries and even from different continents. So a very warm welcome again to all of you. Wherever you are, whatever your time zone, we are very happy that you made the time to join us today. And this makes our forum actually one of the most diverse that we have ever had so far. So why don't you let us know where you're from in the chat? Before we start, we'll have to get into a few technical details. So bear with me for just a few minutes. Right now, we're in the lobby of the event platform. On the right-hand side, you will see the chat function that Judith just mentioned, where you can, for example, introduce yourselves, tell us where you are, tell us what you're working on. And if there is some interest that matches your own, you can get in touch with each and every um, attendee. And you can do that if you look at the bottom of the page. There are several tiles. For example, the tile attendees. There you can find all the other attendees um, and engage with them via the public chat in the lobby or via direct messages. You can even have video calls with one or several people. We should say that, of course, it's entirely up to you how you'd like to engage. If you'd like to remain in the background, that's absolutely fine. We realize that in an event that now has over 600 registrations so far, um, some people need to protect their identity. And you can do that by choosing a pseudonym, changing your name on the platform to a pseudonym. So whenever you make a contribution, it will just the pseudonym showing up. Um, you can also look at the other tiles. There's one tile that says personal program. When you click on that, you will see what is going on just for you. It's your individual program and especially what is up next for you. If you want to look have, uh, have a look at the general program, I'd ask you to go to general information. You will find the program booklet with all the background information, with all the information on the speakers and on the various sessions. You'll also find additional information on the Inspire Europe project and the Humboldt Foundation and the Philip Schwartz Initiative. If you need help, we would suggest not using the lobby chat, but actually the help function that is at the, bottom, at the top of your screen. Then our partners from Congressa will rush to your, to your aid. Um, in the lobby chat, you cannot post anonymous messages, but you can me uh, post messages under your, under your pseudonym. Once you move on into the several parallel sessions, you can actually ask your questions anonymously in the Q&A function. I said before, we have over 600 registrations, and our Inspire Europe partners and the Humboldt Foundation, we try to review all the registrations by hand. Um, but, of course, with such a high number, it's, always, it's not always possible to know each and every single attendee. One important information is that parts of this event will be shared via YouTube. For example, this opening in the lobby and later on the um, workshop on gender and risk. Um, these programs are clearly marked. The program parts are clearly marked in the program booklet. And um, so please do have a look. The lobby chat that's going on while the sessions are ongoing will not be shared publicly. Two last points. There is media interest in the topics that we are discussing today and tomorrow, so there may be one or two journalists joining us, but they've all been instructed that people need to protect their identity. Nobody will be identified, and no identifying details will be published. And finally, a small number of uh, sessions will be recorded. Those recordings will only be for internal 
for, for internal use, for our internal review, so that we can actually take away as many informations as we can, so they will not be shared beyond the Humboldt Foundation or the Inspire Europe project. Thank you so much, and now back to you, Judith. Thank you so much, Frank. Yeah, this is a very special day for us, uh, for several reasons, actually. Uh, first, uh, 2021 marks the fifth anniversary of the Philip Schwab Initiative. So uh, let me take the opportunity to thank the Federal Foreign Office, who not only partnered with us in launching this initiative in the first place, but who also continue to support, uh, but also whose continuous support um, is making this forum possible. And also, I'd love, I'd love to extend a very warm um, thank you to the uh, Federal Foreign Office. And uh, this forum is also special because we are convening it together with our partners from the Inspire Europe uh, project. And we are very proud and grateful for this extremely co cooperative um, uh, partnership. We will learn uh, a little more about the Inspire Europe uh, project later on. But first, let us have a look at what awaits us today. First of all, we'll hear from our Secretary General um, of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, Dr. Enno Aufterheide, and then we are honored to have that the Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office, Michelle Müntefering, will also be sharing her thoughts with us. A bit later on, you may have noticed there has been a change in program. Unfortunately, the European Union's Special Representative for Human Rights, Mr. Eamon Gilmore, cannot join us today, but we will hear from Professor Michael Murphy, President of the European University Association, and from Ms. Themis Christofidou, the Director General for Education, Youth, Culture and Sports of the European Commission. And then Robert Quinn and um, Ilias Salabi of the sorry, Robert Quinn of the Scholars at Risk Network, of course, and um, Ilya Salabi of the Global Public Policy Institute will be sharing a few insights into the Academic Freedom Index. Then after a break, uh, I just um, continue from Frank. We will split up uh, into 10 parallel sessions. Um, they will address a set of diverse uh, but equally important topics, uh, we hope. Um, there will be discussions on the situation of academic freedom in West Africa, in Belarus, in Turkey and in Brazil. We will examine the challenges of working at the intersection of gender and academic freedom and the consequences that, COVID, that the COVID-19 pandemic is having on academic living in exile or under authoritarian regimes. And we will learn about protecting the cultural heritage in Syria and about the personal journey of a Philip Schwab scholar from Yemen. But uh, enough for the introductions for, for now. Let us dive right in. I have now, as Frank mentioned already, um, the great pleasure to uh, welcome on stage, on the virtual stage, the Secretary General of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, Dr. Enno Afterheide. Dr. Afterheide, the floor is yours. Thank you. And welcome to the 2021 Philip Schwartz and Inspire Europe Stakeholder Forum. We are proud to partner with Inspire Europe Project in convening this virtual event, and in particular with Scholars at Risk Europe in Ireland and the PAUSE program in France. Thank you for joining us today. Let me welcome the members of the German Bundestag, the representatives of the German Federal Foreign Office, our partners at Inspire Europe and the many collaborators in our efforts to protect persecuted scholars and academic freedom. A particularly warm welcome to the scholars that are joining us from across Europe, to their academic hosts and the representatives of the host institutions. The Philip Schwartz Initiative was launched by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and the Federal Foreign Office five years ago. Until today, 280 scholars from 19 countries have found safety at more than 90 host institutions across Germany. 280 scholars that were able to restart their lives and careers. A number of these scholars have courageously allowed us to share their stories with a wider audience in a publication. This publication, entitled A New Beginning, will be shared with all of you at the end of the forum. Some of these scholars are joining us in the audience and as speakers today and tomorrow. Thank you for your willingness to help raise awareness for the plight of displaced scholars 
and for the fragility of it, the academic freedom. And let me in this context also thank the academic mentors that have added their perspective and advice. Looking back at the past five years, it strikes me that the history of the Philip Schwartz Initiative is in a way a history of partnerships. The initiative arose and continues to benefit from the close partnership between the Humboldt Foundation and the Foreign Office. It was conceived with an indispensable advice from partners that have been doing this work for decades. The Scholars at Risk Network, the Council for at Risk Academics, and the Scholar Rescue Fund. It first came into reality through the trust that several private foundations placed in the Humboldt Foundation at a time when the initiative was nothing but a concept. And in 2017, it was a particularly generous gift from the US American Andrew W. Mellon Foundation that, that allowed us to significantly expand our support. And it was the German Bundestag that made it a permanent program in 2018. But none of this would have come to fruition if universities and research institutions across Germany had not jumped into action. They developed concepts and structures to offer themselves as safe havens, and they never stopped. The network of the Philipp Schwarz host institutions has grown to 91 members. The German section of the Scholars at Risk Network has more than doubled since it was founded in 2016 and is an important forum for mutual learning and advice. Even our selection committee is defined by partnerships with experts from the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, the German Academic Exchange Service, the National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina, the German Rectors Conference, and from the Council of at Risk Academics, CARA, working hand in hand with excellent academics from various disciplines. In 2019, the Inspire Europe project brought our partnership to the European level. We will learn more about the project later on, so I will just say this. The potential that this project is mobilizing from Paris to Krakow, from Oslo to Thessaloniki is impressive and could not even be stopped by the pandemic. It continues to bring about concrete results based on a sense of collaboration and mutual support. And since the challenges ahead are manifold and complex, we will need to expand and deepen these partnerships. One challenge is, of course, the deteriorating situation of academic freedom in several regions, which sources such as the Academic Freedom Index inform us about. An additional challenge is the current pandemic which has significantly exacerbated the situation in many regions and handed additional instruments of oppression to authoritarian regimes. At the Philipp Schwarz Initiative, we are seeing that scholars in more and more countries are in need of our support. Another type of challenge presents itself closer to home. Even if more scholars receive support through our initiative or others, it is always only temporary security. It is just the first step in a difficult journey to a truly secure and therefore truly free existence. European academic systems compel everyone into a demanding competition for funds and positions, especially for the rare long-term positions. Exiled scholars face this competition with the heavy burden of having gone through a severe disruption in their lives and work. Our attention and support must therefore focus on the future of each scholar. On the transition at the end of each fellowship, we are recently able to improve our support by introducing the possibility to employ scholars, not only via research fellowships, but through regular employment contracts, once again through the generous support of the Foreign Office. This has important practical implications for a scholar's legal and professional status. But it is only a contribution, not a solution. The challenges for each and every scholar and their hosts remain high, and we have to support them in exploring all options and avenues within and beyond academia. At this point, I would like to acknowledge how generously the Academics in Solidarity program at Freie Universität Berlin 
has shared their expertise and networks to create a coaching and training program tomorrow afternoon that is tailored to provide exactly that support to scholars. We as funders cannot claim to have all the answers, but we can listen and we can offer our assistance in addressing challenges together with the host institutions and academic mentors and with our partners. This is what this forum is about. It is, it is the result of countless collaborations and partnerships. How encouraging that we are so many willing to come together to work for the protection of scholars and of academic freedom. I thank you for your attention, but before we launch into what I expect to be a particularly multifaceted forum, I would like to give the floor to the Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office, Michel Müntefering. Dear members of the German Bundestag and of the Diplomatic Service, dear scholars, academic mentors, host institution representatives, dear members of the Inspire Europe project and partners from across the globe. It was on an April day like this that Philipp Schwarz was dismissed from his university post in 1933. Years of academic research and commitment shattered into pieces. He lost his work he had to flee his own country, but he found a safe haven. He became university professor in Istanbul and he helped many other scholars persecuted by the Nazi regime make a new beginning in Turkey. Many of them returned to Germany after the Second World War and helped rebuild the country. It was in honor of Philipp Schwartz that we started an initiative for scholars at risk five years ago. This initiative reflected the responsibility originating from the persecution of scientists during the Nazi regime. Originally, it was developed primarily in response to the crisis in Syria. But in the meantime, it has provided a safe haven for scholars from 19 different countries. It is surely no cause for celebration that the need for scholar protection programs is rising. But unfortunately, this is the sad truth. The spaces for free speech and free academic research are shrinking worldwide. For each and every scholar who faces the effects of this development, this means great hardship. But also for the global community as a whole, it is a dangerous development. We all know the challenges ahead of us are huge. The corona pandemic has shown once again that we are all sitting in the same boat. It is impossible to decouple from development elsewhere, be it global heating or pandemic. In order to master global challenges, we need global responses. And that is not only by states, but by the entire global community. Foreign policy is too important to be left to governments alone. This sentence by Willy Brandt is more true than ever. It is only through the ideas and the determination of civil society and by cross-border cooperation that we will be able to succeed. If we look back in history, it was always through the exchange of people and ideas that progress was made. Just recently, the Masons Guild system was admitted into the UNESCO list of immaterial world heritage. Monuments such as the Cologne Cathedral wouldn't have been possible without the transnational expertise within the medieval fabrics. The same is true for today. The vac vaccination against COVID-19 was developed in record time. Why? because scientists around the world shared their knowledge from the genetic deciphering of the virus up to the testing of medication. 
and is surely a lucky chance for Germany that the BioNTech vaccine was developed by two German scientists whose parents came here as migrants from Turkey. Exchange and openness trigger innovation. Nationalism and isolation mean stagnation. It is as simple as that. And that is why we have made science diplomacy a cornerstone of our new international cultural policy strategy. The basic idea is quite simple. We want to facilitate international academic exchange by creating new platforms of exchange and by keeping shrinking spaces open. We don't see academic exchange as a zero-sum game. We don't want to draw all bright minds to Germany. Rather, we see science diplomacy as a means to keep the stream of people and ideas afloat. Metaphorically speaking, less of a vacuum cleaner, more of a fan. One central element within this strategy is the protection of academic freedom for those who have been placed at risk by armed conflict, but also for those facing political or identity-based persecution. Our goal is clear. Sustaining intellectual power and the gift of critical discourse worldwide. For this aim, we need strong partners, partners such as the Humboldt Foundation. For almost 70 years, the foundation has fostered academic exchange across political and ideological borders. Also, it is very important for us to strengthen the European dimension of our science diplomacy. As Europeans, we share the same vision of an open and transnational, international academic exchange. That is why in 2019, I signed a joint Franco-German declaration with Ambassador Anne-Marie Deco. In this declaration, we we're calling on our EU partners to join our efforts in supporting academic freedom worldwide. This declaration has now become a reality. Today we are coming together, not only under the umbrella of the Philip Schwartz Initiative, but also of the Inspire Europe project. This Europe-wide alliance of 10 partners supports academics at risk protecting academic freedom and providing welcome advice to policy makers. Dear ladies and gentlemen, the start of the Philip Schwartz initiative five years ago was a crucial step. It is now the oldest and largest program of its design and scale in Europe. Since then, other important steps have followed, from the Martin Roth Initiative for Artists and Members of the Cultural Sector to the Elisabeth Selbert Initiative for Human Rights Defenders. It has even become a reference point for programs abroad, such as the Paus program at the Collège de France, which was launched in 2017 and is now one of the Philip Schwartz Initiative's closest partners. It is in this tradition that I am glad to announce the most recent addition to our range of protection programs. Two weeks ago, the Foreign Office and the German Academic Exchange Service launched the Hilde Domin program. Building upon the Philipp Schwarz Initiative, the scholarship program will enable at-risk students from the undergraduate to the doctoral level to continue and complete their studies at a higher education institution in Germany. This further broadens our efforts in supporting academics and academic freedom worldwide. Namesake for the new program is the German-Jewish poet Hilde Domin, who was forced to continue her studies in exile in the 1930s. Dear ladies and gentlemen, 
almost 300 scholars at risk could continue their scientific work in Germany thanks to the Philipp Schwarz Initiative. Behind this number are 300 personal stories of people who had to overcome many challenges to reach Germany, to settle in, to restart a new life and to find a place in a new society and a competitive labor market. I myself had the privilege to meet some of the very first Philip Schwartz Fellows in 2017, for example, a Syrian scholar pursuing research at Ruhr University, University Bochum. I recently learned that he is now employed in the private sector. Like so many others, he is enriching our society with his ideas, with his work, with his commitment. Protecting academic freedom is not an abstract, abstract exercise. It is about the protection of human beings like him and his family. It is about giving them the chance to carry on their research. And it is about us as a global community to opt for openness and cooperation instead of nationalism and isolation. The Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office, Ms. Michelle Müntefering, thank you very much for your thoughts. We just heard about the Hilde Domin program of the German Academic Exchange Service, and our colleagues are joining us at the forum today and tomorrow. And tomorrow at the virtual lunchtime fair, the German Academic Exchange Service will be happy to answer any of your questions on that program for students at risk. Let's now turn to the European level. Sinead O'Gorman directs the Scholars at Risk European Office, and she previously served as the Deputy Director of Scholars at Risk New York. Even before, she worked with the Institute of International Education and CARA and others. And so it is very fitting that the, she is one of the original minds behind the Inspire Europe project. And she has now been shepherding us, the Inspire Europe Consortium, since 2019. Sinead, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Frank, and really congratulations on a great start to this event. Good afternoon and good morning, all. Um, if you're just joining us, I welcome you to the 2021 Philip Schwartz and Inspire Europe Stakeholder Forum. Our next session is European Policy Action for Researchers at Risk. And as Frank mentioned, I'm Sinead O'Gorman. I direct Scholars at Risk Europe, hosted at Maynooth University in Ireland. And our office coordinates the EU-funded Inspire Europe project. And this is a 10-partner initiative to improve European coordination and support for researchers at risk. We're really privileged to count the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, the host of today's event, as a very strong partner in this work. At the core of the Inspire Europe project, is a shared understanding that there can be no excellence in research without academic freedom and without free and open scientific debate. So together with our project partners and our networks that reach into all corners of Europe and beyond, we stand in solidarity with the many researchers around the world today who face threats to their academic freedom, to their lives or to their work. In particular, our thoughts today are with Dr. Akhmadriza Jalali, a Swedish Iranian researcher on the fifth anniversary of his imprisonment in Iran, where he is facing the death penalty. Scholars at Risk calls for his immediate relief, release and his safe return to his family. Inspire Europe is trying to anchor and promote the many support efforts already underway in Europe for researchers at risk, such as the Philip Schwartz Initiative in Germany, the PAUSE program in France, the National Scholars at Risk sections in 11 European countries, and the many institutional efforts elsewhere. We're working to coordinate, replicate, and expand such support to new countries and to new sectors. Inspire Europe also provides policy input to the European level on how to strengthen support for researchers at risk, 
and we're very fortunate to have the European Universities Association as a leading partner in these activities. It is therefore my pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Murphy, President of the European University Association, to say a few words on behalf of EUA and to introduce the Director General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture, whom we are honoured to have with us here today. Professor Murphy has previously held a variety of leadership roles, including President of University College Cork for a decade, Vice Chancellor of the National University of Ireland, Chair of the Irish Universities Association, and many more. And I'm delighted that Professor Murphy also serves on the advisory board of the Inspire Europe project. Thank you, Michael, for joining us today, and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Sinead. It's a pleasure to join you and to affirm the importance of this agenda for Europe's universities. Uh, EUA is staunchly committed to academic freedom and to the rights of all people to pursue knowledge, whether personal learning or through discovery and research. And it's a right that requires eternal vigilance to defend it, uh, challenged through history, uh, and challenged even today in many parts of the world, including some European countries. Uh, our philosophy is enshrined, of course, in the Magna Carta Universitatum, uh, the association where co-founders of the Magna Carta Observatory, and we help to sustain it. And we also provide a service where we regularly monitor and update on university autonomy and academic freedom across Europe, in our autonomy scorecard. Back in 2015, we established a refugees welcome map to capture and to showcase the commitment of Europe's universities and organizations to support refugees and to foster peer learning collaboration. And today, if you visit that map on our website, you will see over 300 universities uh, in over 30 countries all offering opportunities of various kinds to support refugee students and academics, and mostly from their own institutional resources. This work is now captured and carried forward in our collaboration with uh, Scholars at Risk uh, in the uh, Inspire Europe project. Uh, and we recognize that the biggest challenge we face in fostering this program is limited resources. Uh, universities are enthused and committed, but constrained in finances. And it is wonderful to see support from uh, foundations such as the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and I congratulate them on the uh, Philip Schwartz Initiative, but also, of course, support from the European Union. Uh, we appreciate the Commission's investment in this project, but we also think that we do need to grow capacity further, and the Commission can play a part in this, perhaps by uh, offering some scholarships um, to support refugee academics. Not just for that money or that support, but because it will send a big signal to national governments that they too have a part to play through a multiplier effect. Uh, it's a proposal that uh, would be fully aligned with the Erasmus Plus agenda in mobility. Uh, and it would, of course, honor European values, which both the European universities and the Commission uh, support. But all of that said, it's not my job to put pressure on the next speaker, though she does have significant influence on these matters. And it is a pleasure for me to uh, introduce a very senior, distinguished member of the Commission uh, who has personal experience of humanitarian issues in her career. Uh, Themis Christat Fidu is the Director General for Education youth, sport and culture at the Commission. She's a civil engineer, worked in the private sector for some 15 years, and then held various roles, including head of cabinet of the Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Management. So she has personal experience. Uh, an alumna of Metsovio Polytechnic University in Athens, she was born in Cyprus, in Northern Cyprus. Again, a personal experience of importance and it is my pleasure to welcome Themis and to introduce her to you. So Themis, you have the floor. Thank you, Professor Murphy, dear Michael. 
ladies and gentlemen, let me start by uh, thanking uh, Minister Michelle Minterfering for her inspiring words a while ago. And of course, by thanking the Inspire Europe team for organizing this stakeholder forum and for all the hard work over the past year, despite the difficult circumstances. I would also like to congratulate the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and the German Federal Foreign Office for the successful five years of the Philip Schwartz Initiative, these first five years. And may they be, there be many, many more. Your work has been truly inspiring and should serve as an example to others. Academic freedom and freedom of scientific research are key European principles. They are not only essential for the proper functioning of academia. They are key to democracy and free societies, where people can access information and decide what is best for them. That is why academic freedom is highlighted in both the European education area and the European research area, not to mention that it is enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And we have the backing of our European leaders behind the words on paper. Just last October, our Ministers for Research adopted the Bonn Declaration of Freedom of Scientific Research. But you all know this, and I'm fully aware that I'm speaking to a like-minded crowd today. Few people have, have done and are doing so much work on behalf of academic freedom and scholars at risk as the people with us today. Inspire Europe has been a very successful project supported by the Marie Skodowska Curie Action. With EU support, you have put in practice the values and ideals that guide our policies and programs. Not only have you been of tremendous help to many researchers at risk, but you have helped that we have you have kept us apprised of the challenges we face on this issue, informing our next steps. From our side at the European Commission, we want to keep making our programs more accessible to researchers at risk. Supporting them serves a double purpose. Not only are we investing in excellent science, we are also making sure that those who would oppose freedom do not get their way. Of course, we cannot do this alone, not even with the fantastic backing of Inspire Europe. EU member states need to be on board and to do more and more in parallel to our work to support researchers at risk. And why not follow the example of the Philip Schwartz Initiative in Germany or the PAUSE program in France? On our side, the Marie Skodowska Curie Actions continue helping researchers at risk also in the New Horizon Europe program. We will build on the evidence and recommendations of the Inspire Europe project and of the wider community. We are very much looking forward to the outcomes of this forum, as well as other events to come. And dear Michael, I heard you, and indeed you have spotted my uh, background and my soft spot for, for refugees. Uh, and. Uh, I will just say here that we are open-minded about new initiatives that would fill the existing gaps. Dear friends, thank you for all your work. You make sure those that stand against censorship have somewhere to turn to. This is Europe in practice, a community based on shared values, putting funds and work where our collective mouth is. And not just regarding places far away, but also closer to home, where it can be more inconvenient to speak up. The urgency of this agenda is illustrated also in the concerns expressed by several countries about the situation in Belarus, for example. All these are very important matters, and I regret that I cannot stay longer today. I would have lo loved to join the debate, but my team is here and they will be with you and, and they will be discussing with me after this event. And I know that I'm leaving you in the very able hands of Professor Murphy, the Inspire Europe team, and Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, who have made this event possible. And I also know that our paths are bound to cross again, because we have a lot of work to do. 
I thank you and I wish you an excellent debate. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Themis. And uh, I certainly detected your personal enthusiasm for the agenda. And we, of course, we appreciate your overview of uh, Commission policy and uh, Commission's support, tangible support for these projects. And I especially welcome your remarks on the need for member states to do more, recognizing France and Germany, for example, but all should really step up to the plate. And I also thank you for your commitment to being guided by the outcomes of the Inspire Europe project um, and that you're open minded to our initiatives, including the one I just mentioned. Uh, and yes, we too share the uh, urgency you mentioned in Belarus and some other uh, Eastern European countries. So we look forward to working with your team in the coming months uh, to ramp up our initiatives. Uh, about which we all share a passion. And I also look forward to hosting you again on Thursday at the EUA Council. So we might even have further conversation on this. So EUA is committed, the Commission is committed, and uh, now back to Sinead to uh, hear a little more about uh, the specific details of uh, Inspire Europe and the upcoming elements of the forum. So thank you, Sinead, for having us and uh, have a very fruitful two days. My sincere thanks to you, uh, Michael, Professor Murphy, and also to Themis Christofido for your very important contributions today. Um, I'm afraid we need to move ahead onto our next session already. Um, and this is a session that moves us from the, uh, the European responses to the global responses to pressures on academic freedom. And I'm delighted to introduce Robert Quinn and Ilya Saliba, who will lead this next session on global responses measuring academic freedom. Robert Quinn is a human rights advocate, lecturer, lawyer, and founding executive director of Scholars at Risk. And Scholars at Risk, as many of you know, is an international network of over 500 higher education institutions and thousands of individuals in more than 40 countries dedicated to protecting at-risk scholars, promoting academic freedom, and defending everyone's freedom to think, question, and share ideas. Rob is the host of the Free to Think podcast, which I highly recommend, and author of numerous articles and publications on academic freedom. Rob is joined in this session by Ilyas Saliba. Ilyas is a research fellow at the Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin, where he focuses on democracy and human rights in the Middle East and North Africa, and contributes to GPPI's work on measuring academic freedom. Rob and Ilyas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of the organizers of this event uh, and, and congratulate the Humboldt Foundation and Philip Schwartz in initiative on five years, uh, Inspire Europe, Star Germany. Thank you to the German ministry and of course to the European Commission for your important work, uh, especially with the Bonn Declaration, but also in pushing in your remarks and in your work outside of this event, the importance of academic freedom. So uh, we have two projects we want to tell you about, in particular the Academic Freedom Index that my colleague Ilyas will discuss. Uh, and then I'll give you a little bit on a, on a recent study we've done on self-censorship in the academic space. All of these go towards better understanding of academic freedom, pointing out the need for greater research, uh, using that information to measure so that we can also come up with policy recommendations to improve protection for scholars, for students, and for academic freedom. So Ilyas, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, before we dive into the data, and I think um, there will be a presentation that will be shared, if I'm uh, informed correctly, um, I just wanted to highlight that this is uh, the Academic Freedom Index is a collaborative uh, project of uh, the Wiedem Institute at the University of Gothenburg, um, the Friedrich Alexander University in Nuremberg, Erlangen, and Scholars at Risk, as well as Global Public Policy Institute, where I'm based in Berlin. Um, and uh, maybe if we can move on, that's the, the three partners on that slide. If we can move to the next slide, um, here are the 2020 scores for the Academic Freedom Index. Uh, they can be illustrated in such a way as a heat map. 
um, as on this slide. The greener countries are the ones achieving good or very good scores on the Academic Freedom Index for 2020, whereas the yellow ones are in the middle and the orange or red ones are rather on the low end of the spectrum. Um, what we can take from this map, uh, one of the many things we can take from this map, is that around 80% of the world's population actually still live in countries that restrict and to some extent heavily restrict academic freedom today. If we move to the next slide, I'll um, explain a little bit in a few words what uh, the index is actually composed of. There are five indicators that feed into the Academic Freedom Index. Uh, there's one indicator on the freedom to teach and research. There's one on um, the freedom of academic exchange and dissemination of uh, academic results and research. Um, and both of these are also probably those that matter most uh, if we discuss self-censorship, as we will uh, surely later on after Rob's remark on uh, remarks on the recent study. Um, then third, institutional autonomy from political influence and aspects of also containing aspects of self-governance are the third indicator. The fourth one is campus integrity. That basically means the freedom of securitization of campus and surveillance on campus, harassment on campus, um, and also includes online surveillance. Um, and lastly, uh, there's the um, indicator on academic and cultural um, expression that captures the degree to which academics are free to voice their um, messages politically uh, and to raise their voice politically, sorry. Um, we hoped into VDEM's existing project on, democ on measuring democracy. Um, they have a well-established methodology for questionnaires. Um, they have a pool, pool of experts all around the world and they have a methodology on how to aggregate the expert scores. Um, the average uh, score, which means basically a country and the level of academic freedom in that country in a specific year, uh, is coded by around 10 experts. So each of the country year data points that we have in the data set is coded by around 10 experts on average, and they are usually recruited from the countries um, that uh, they are living in and that they are also judging on the index. Um, so on the next slide, um, we can see that the Academic Freedom Index is actually more than this snapshot that I showed you in the heat map, right? That's a snapshot of 2020. But the Academic Freedom Index is actually much more than that because it provides historical data for some countries even back to the 1900. And um, with such time series data that is depicted here um, as global averages on the five indicators that I've just introduced, dating back from 1900 to today, uh, we can do, of course, much more sophisticated analysis and we can use it uh, also differently than if it would just be a snapshot of today. Um, what should raise some alarm on this slide is that after a steady uptake in the early 90s, uh, since the early 90s around the globe, uh, when we come to the global average scores, uh, we have seen a little damp and basically a negative uh, decline since around 2013 on the global level on average. Um, on the next slide, um, you'll see that uh, we just depicted some countries that have witnessed very significant changes in the uh, Academic Freedom Index scores over the past five years. To give you some examples of uh, how you can use the Academic Freedom Index to identify where there have been, for example, the most significant changes. Um, on the next slide, um, we'll show you how you can also use the Academic Freedom Index data to compare the academic freedom scores of countries in more recent time periods. As for example here, with, uh, done with two countries that have witnessed significant decline of academic freedom over the past 20 years, Belarus and Sri Lanka, and two countries that have had positive trajectories when it comes to academic freedom in the past 20 years, and that is Tunisia and Kazakhstan. Um, on the next slide, um, I'll just give you a screenshot of uh, the VDEM website, and the link is there in the, in the top as well. And if you're interested in playing around with this data yourself, in exploring what's in it, uh, you can really simply just exit VDEM, access VDEM's website and their online graphing tools if you just want to play around and don't want to necessarily download the entire uh, data set, that's something I would recommend, so check that out. 
Um, I've got no time to show you now, but I promise it's very intuitive and very easy to use. And you can create graphs like the ones that I've shown you uh, in this presentation fairly easily online. Um, on the next slide, um, I'll just give you um, some covers of uh, reports that we've uh, already um, issued, exactly. So, so, so there's one policy report that we've issued based on the Academic Freedom Index together with Rob and Katrin Kinselbach from uh, FAU University. And uh, we've developed also recommendations, policy recommendations, action uh, recommendations for a variety of stakeholders in the higher ed uh, sphere. Um, that's uh, governments, but that's also parliaments, um, advocacy organizations and scholars themselves and universities. Um, and despite, um, maybe on the last slide, just going to close with this, um, despite the obvious advantages that I've just tried to highlight of the Academic Freedom Index as global and historical uh, kind of uh, data, um, there's, of course, always some shortcomings to expert-coded, quantified uh, methods of data collection. Um, the advantages are obviously comparability um, historically and globally, um, but then again, the, the downsides are the quality of the data in terms of its uh, depth are, of course, restricted. So what we've also tried to do in our project on measuring academic freedom um, is that we try to develop guidelines for qualitative case studies, country case studies on academic freedom, and work with country experts in issuing a number of case studies on academic freedom. And they were actually published in the book that you could see on the, re on the last slide. Um, so that's freely available online. If you feel like you want to dig in more into this, um, yeah, just look for it and check it out. And now I'm really, yeah, looking forward to uh, our discussion and hearing more about the censorship survey study that you conducted with Alpha Naro. Thank you, Ilyas. Uh, and it really is, I just need to emphasize, you know, as many of the prior speakers said, academic freedom is essential to quality research and teaching and public discourse. And so knowing that we really need a tool like this to do a better job of measuring it and understanding it. And it's a really rigorous, rigorous tool and data set. It is all transparent. So I really want to echo to people go to the VDEM website, play with the data yourselves, and help inform us uh, on how we can use this data. And we'll come back to how we can use this data in just a second. But I also wanted to flag a much smaller study that we just did in partnership with ALF and our media, um, where the index is focused on expert assessments and multiple experts assessing on the same criteria. Um, what we wanted to look at is the subjective experience, the personal experience with academic freedom uh, that many scholars experience. Um, and so with ALF and our media, we partnered on a survey of academic self-censorship defined as refraining from asking questions or doing research or publishing one's findings or one's theories in the professional space, professional expression, because of threats, either professional or legal uh, or, or um, physical retaliation. Uh, and the format, if we could move to the slides, it was an anon it's, it's an anonymous online survey. So we know a better methodology would be desirable, but at the same time, it's extremely difficult uh, to measure academic self-censorship. So if I could ask if we could show the results slide, uh, this results came out just a few weeks ago, um, again, in the Arab region. 75% uh, of respondents said that they self-censor at least sometimes, uh, and 40% frequently or always self-censor. Um, at the same time, we also asked them how many of their colleagues do they believe self-censor, and it was similar. They said 76% of their colleagues and a major 34% a majority said a majority or all of their colleagues self-censor. 25% sadly have said they have personally experienced retaliation in the past year for their academic work. And 47% are aware of colleagues who have. Um, so overall, you see a real dampening dynamic of holding down academic inquiry and expression. And this um, is supported by a prior survey conducted by Alfanar, which showed 91% of re uh, researchers in the region wanted to leave. And of those, 43% cited lack of academic freedom. 
so again, if I could ask for see the slides, we have a few charts we can show you. Uh, the uh, most commonly feared retaliations, 60% uh, uh, feared arrest or prosecution. Uh, one more slide, please. Uh, 54, uh, one more. 54% you see loss of position, travel restrictions, harassment, including escalating online harassment or trolling, uh, and 25% feared violence directly against themselves. Uh, the next slide, please. We see the sources that people fear. 58% um, feared their own home government. Uh, not far behind, sadly, is their own university at 51%, and perhaps even saddest, 40% uh, feared some kind of retaliation by colleagues or peers, uh, and that could, of course, include uh, departmental heads or institutional uh, heads. Um, finally, the big picture we asked, are things getting better or worse um, compared to the prior year? Were you more or less likely to self-censor? Here, it's a little bit mixed. We don't really have enough data to draw the conclusion. 30% say more likely to self-censor on the next slide. 22% say less likely. Uh, and about half are in the middle. Of course, when you look at this and say 76% say they are self-censoring, at least sometimes, about the same isn't a particularly good uh, picture. Uh, and then finally, I just want to emphasize, um, we know this is difficult to measure, um, but it's very real as a dynamic. Uh, again, 75, 76% saying they self-censor, and for good reason. If you compare that subjective experience to scholars at risk reporting on attacks on higher education in our free to think reports, or to the data in the Academic Freedom Index, you see that this is a rational exercise on the part of those who are self-censoring because the threats are very real. Um, the big picture is that this is a drag on not only universities and research in the Arab world, but on societies. It represents a major loss in productivity and in intellectual and social and economic capital. And the reason we wanted to look at self-censorship is we often talk about brain drain, which is, of course, the physical loss of people. But we really also need to talk about brain drag, which is even the people who stay are not able to work at their highest levels because they have to think twice before they publish or before they speak uh, on their work. We think it's highly likely that we would find similar findings in other regions, again, based on comparison to index data and to free to think monitoring and to the casework that we and partner programs like Philip Schwartz and others uh, all have. Uh, and we need more study. So this is a call to anyone attending or to those you know who may be interested in partnering with us on repeating this survey or deepening the survey in the Arab region or in other regions of the world, uh, we'd be very, very eager to do so. So um, now I do want to emphasize this survey is not in any way nearly as rigorous or deep as the Academic Freedom Index. And I'd like to come back in our final few minutes to Ilyas. Uh, and perhaps, Ilyas, could I, I ask, what are some of the ways the index data could be used that we'd like to flag uh, for those who are attending? I mean, one of the applications would be that uh, so far, university rankings do not reflect academic freedom uh, at all, right? These university excellence rankings that we all know and that are part of you know, a lot of higher ed uh, policy thinking and resource management and also at the university department level, they're surely discussed. So they have quite a lot of power in creating incentives. Um, and we would argue that they should include academic freedom, that academic freedom should feature into their assessment of university excellence and that it should mitigate, uh, you know, the other scores to some extent. And if I could, yes, um, most rankings are using institution level data. The academic freedom is country level data. So how can they how can they use the data without having to entirely change their methodology? Well, either they could uh, simply, you know, have a, a kind of a flag of information uh, based on the country that a um, ranked institution is based in or is hosted in and, uh, you know, give some information about the level of academic freedom in that country. If they do not want to kind of apply broadly the country scores to all uh, institutions that are based in that country, and to mitigate their score, they could simply inform the readers about this. And I think there they really have a responsibility because a lot of scholars and researchers and students base their decisions on where to apply for jobs, for programs, um, graduate programs and so on, 
uh, on these rankings. And I think we need to be open about the situation of academic freedom in these countries and these host institutions. And, and what about governments, Ilyas? We heard a bit earlier about a reminder about the Bonn Declaration signed by well, 27 countries, I believe. Um, the European higher education area has been looking more deeply into um, how to measure or monitor. How can, how can the index data help with those initiatives? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of initiatives on monitoring and actually assessing academic freedom um, internationally going on now, such as the ones you've mentioned. And I think here, among other sources, such as, you know, the Scholars at Risk Monitor uh, or uh, casework and qualitative case studies, the Academic Freedom Index is really well positioned because it, it uh, provides comparative data uh, and over time data to actually be included in such monitoring processes. And this is not only true for governmental agencies and, and you know, quality assurance agencies in, in the realm of higher education, but also for research funders. And it can also serve this purpose uh, for university administrations that are uh, assessing risks of certain international co corporations or so on. So I think um, in this monitoring realm, there's a lot of possibility. Could you say a little bit more there when you say for individual universities, right, how they could use the index? Uh, and you said in sort of research partnerships or study abroad, research abroad. Can you elaborate? Of course, um, I'm happy to do so. Well, there's actually already some movement in some universities that are kind of recalibrating, reassessing their international corporations and trying to make them uh, fit uh, in for the fact that you know sometimes they actually have risks for uh, academic freedom um, and this is uh, some of the international corporations such as um, research collaboration or study abroad programs and uh, the academic freedom index could be used here to you know inform the decisions of uh, the international uh, administration of international uh, corporation at universities whether there is enhanced risks of cooperation, whether there's risks for the researchers and students involved, whether there's risks of data sharing um, and so on. And they could then uh, kind of adjust it uh, to the level of academic freedom or the violations thereof in the country, um, kind of make complementary adjustments when it comes to risk management, when it comes to preparation, when it comes to legal safeguards um, uh, towards uh, the uh, respect of academic freedom and the rights of the scholars and students participating in such cooperation. So when we set out to, to build the index, of course, the thinking was on the positive side, that this would help to promote uh, academic freedom, which is, as we've said, is essential to quality teaching and research and discourse. Uh, but thank you for flagging that there's also, on the negative side, a risk uh, management dimension that this could be helpful. Um, I think we only have a few minutes left, Ilyas, but I'd like to ask you, if you are someone working at a ministry of education uh, and the index is out and you're asked to go look at this thing, um, how can they use it, not from the negative side, not from a uh, you know, damage control reputation issue, but are there positive ways to use the index to strengthen higher education systems and practices? And, and how would they look into that? Yeah, um, well, I think... If you're in a, let's say, rich country, which uh, you know can partner up and has partnership programs where they try to build capacities of high, other higher education programs in other countries, they can also use the Academic Freedom Index to um, analyze which countries have gone into the right direction, where there might have, might be an opening to pursue more, uh, you know. Um, more stronger uh, policies to um, enshrining academic freedom principles in the higher education governance systems um, and the governance of universities themselves. And here, you know, higher education policymakers can turn to the Academic Freedom Index to see which countries might be feasible um, and uh, in which countries there's opening space for such debates um, based on the scores in the Academic Freedom Index. Terrific. And with our last few minutes, Ilyas, um, the index was released last year, um, although this year the data was more inclusive. It had many more countries in it than it did in the first iteration. Um, what has been the reaction so far that you've seen and how would you like to see this project develop? 
there have been quite a few media who've picked it up. And of course, also, uh, we've been already approached by a few state actors, especially here in Europe. Um, but I would like this to be, you know, discussed wider in policy circles, not only in the uh, higher education uh, ministries, but also in foreign ministries. I mean, it was nice to see, and it's it's great to see the support from the German Foreign Office for the Philip Schwartz Initiative here, um, and uh, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. I think we need to bring the discussions about measuring and, and policy and academic freedom also into the foreign offices uh, of uh, this world. Um, because, of course, we can also think about using uh, human rights compliance mechanisms and monitoring mechanisms to strengthen uh, academic freedom globally. And um, then further on, I would like to see more um, usage of this data by actual university administrations. Um, we've been in touch with few university administrations who are now thinking about um, applying some kind of um, monitoring system for their collaborations. Um, and using the Academic Freedom Index, but I would actually like to see this more in the future. Well, thank you, Ilyas. And let me add, since you mentioned it there, that we on Scholars at Risk side, we have been using the academic freedom in our advocacy work. Uh, we have appended the tables. Uh, we have added data from our own case monitoring and submitted that to the Universal Periodic Review, the Human Rights System of the UN in Geneva, as well as to the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which oversees one of the conventions that protects uh, academic freedom. So again, to wrap up, um, thank you, Ilyas, as a, a great partner to everyone at GPPI. Thank you to all the organizers for giving us a minute to share this project. For all of us in this community where you know our core work is dedicated to assisting research at risk, at risk scholars at risk, um, we also want to spend some time looking at the conditions that are putting them at risk. And the Academic Freedom Index is a tool that can really help us do this. Uh, our small self-censorship survey is just another window into that. Uh, and I especially want to thank the German uh, uh, ministry uh, for their work, including on the Bonn Declaration and, and moving that forward uh, to the European Commission for looking at this very seriously about how to uh, do more to assist researchers at risk, uh, including with Inspire, but also beyond Inspire. Uh, and really want to thank all the attendees. And Ilyas, how can people uh, be in touch if they want to know more about the index, uh, how to use it, or potentially either how to be an expert assessor or uh, to help deploy it going forward? Um, well, best, best is just to turn to the VDEM website. And uh, there you can access the data as I've shown in the presentation using the online graphing tools. If you want to register as an expert uh, coder, for example, for a certain country, uh, you can either approach VDEM directly. I think they have a link up there um, for how to approach them as an expert coder or get in touch with us at GPPI uh, using gppi.net slash academic freedom and uh, approaching us there um, via email and send us your um, CV and so on, and we'll uh, check it out and forward it to VDEM and work with them so that we can grow our uh, expert coders and make the data even better. Terrific, so for those interested in being researchers, go to VDEM. Uh, for those who are interested in using the index and helping us to promote academic freedom on the human rights side, please reach out to Scholars at Risk. Uh, if you are in a, a ranking company uh, or if you're in a state and you'd like to see how we can be useful with this tool, uh, please reach out to GPPI or to Scholars at Risk. And with that, again, I want to thank the organizers for this event. I also want to take this opportunity to echo Sinead's earlier call. Um, all of this is about assisting threatened scholars, and we are very concerned for Dr. Amadreza Jalali uh, on the fifth anniversary of his imprisonment in Iran. Uh, and we in our community do call on the Iranian government to recognize his very poor health uh, and to see if he could be released uh, as soon as possible. So I thank you all. Thank you very much, Rob and Ilias, for this fantastically insightful conversation. Um, and thank you to all the other contributors to this opening of the forum.